Good morning, everybody, on this Monday morning, and welcome to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network, brought to you, of course, by the good folks at Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. All right, busy time. Uh, the Knicks up three games to one. We'll play uh, tomorrow. We'll preview that tomorrow. Uh, Knicks come home to try and wrap things up. Probably the same kind of game we've had all along. Uh, very intense series. Uh, I think by far, despite the fact uh, there's series 2-2, I, I, I still think this is the best series by far, most intense without any question. Games have been good. Uh, and right now the Knicks with a 3-1 lead will come home and try and wrap it up tomorrow night. Rangers uh, will await the winner of Carolina and the Islanders. The uh, Hurricanes can wrap it up tomorrow night. Um, so... Both series would be starting probably Friday, Saturday at the Garden, the next round, uh, when we move on to the next round. And uh, like I said, everybody told me that uh, the Islanders would not beat Carolina and that Carolina was going to be a complete handful uh, for the Rangers. Matter of fact, they favored Carolina over the Rangers. It'd be interesting to see with the Rangers having home ice, who's the favorite in the series, because Carolina was the favorite to win it all. Uh, in the betting odds. So, uh, interestingly, when the uh, playoffs began. Um, so, we have that to deal with. Put our finishing touches on the draft. Now, I'm not one of these people who believes in these ridiculous grades, okay? Because all the grades are is a guy who lends his time to this full time, like a Kuiper, as an example. Not just to single him out, but this is what they do. So when it's over, they're going to review it because that's what they do. Everything is about the draft. Uh, The the, the, the draft is their cottage industry. But here's the thing. There's no realistic way to review a draft pick in real time. I mean, it's, 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 it's one of the most foolish things of all time because there's just no way to know. You don't know what's going to happen to the player. You have to let the player develop. There'll be surprises. There's always surprises. There's guys picked on the fifth and sixth round that become stars. There's guys picked in the top five picks who were busts. It happens all the time. But that's not how they grade. They grade based on whether you took a guy that they assumed a certain value on. So the the Falcons get a F with Penix Jr. But what if what if Cousins get hurt gets hurt and Penix Jr. walks in and plays great? You think that's still an F? Or if two years from now, if the Cousins is done, Penix becomes a you know Pro Bowl quarterback, is that still an F? Of course not. I guarantee you nobody liked the love pick when Aaron Rodgers was still in Green Bay. As a matter of fact, I remember that they didn't. You think they like it now? I think they love it now. So you need a couple of years. The best way to judge a draft is when you take guys in the first three rounds, the premium rounds, you expect them to be a contributor and a starter within three years. If you sign that player to a second contract, that player is a bona fide success. That is what you want from your first three rounds. And the study that I saw that was done over a 20-year period, there wasn't that much difference between the first and second and third rounds. There really wasn't for Pro Bowl players. You get almost as many from the second and third round as you get from the first round. And let's be honest, after the first handful of picks, which now has become very quarterback-centric, there's a handful of players every year who stand out. After that, there's no difference between pick 8 or pick 10 and pick 50. There's no difference. This is, you know, it, doesn't, it, makes no, it really makes no difference. What's in the guy's heart, what's in his head, the circumstances he surrounds himself with. So that's what you're left with. The question is... The way I look at it is, I look at it in a bigger picture. Did you fill the needs that you went into the offseason with? You have two ways to do it, premium picks and free agency. The Jets, as an example, had to put premium picks and free agency into the offensive line. They have done that. They have rebuilt the entire offensive line with that. There could be as many as four new starters from guys who were brought in. And that includes the Penn State offensive tackle, who is probably their left tackle of the future, but not when Smith's there. 
So if he can beat out the right tackle right now, which I don't know if they want him to do that or they want him to provide depth on the left side. I don't know what their plan is. But I would use him this year. Now, you hope you're not starting him because that would mean that Smith's down. See, Smith is a Hall of Fame level player. The question is his age and his injury situation. But last year, he took a very high number of snaps and he was the number one rated pass blocking left tackle in the sport. And I think overall the third rated tackle because they, some people didn't like his run blocking. His run blocking is fine. His pass blocking is exceptional. And you're trying to protect a very talented, older quarterback who needs protection and needs it in the, in the worst way. They were in a position to take either Bowers or the third offensive tackle, who in my mind was the second best offensive tackle. I put the Penn State kid ahead of Latham. I did not put him ahead of Alt. I thought Alt would go that high. I, I think Alt's an outstanding prospect, outstanding. But I think this kid is too, and I think this kid's very good at what he does and will be very good. As far as the rest of their draft, to act like anybody knows whether a running back or somebody taken on the fifth or sixth round is going to stick, who knows? I would say this about their third round pick, Malachi Corley. I like getting productive players. I don't care what level they come from. I don't care if they come from Notre Dame or they come from Western Kentucky. I don't care. I like productive college players. I like college players who put up a lot of stats. I like guys who are gamers. That's I've always been partial to the guys who produce in the games rather than the guy who is just, oh, he's just a prospect. You know, he, he has to be molded into this play. No, I want a guy who's a player. And this kid's a player. I think he helps a lot. I think he will be, I think Corley will be a big factor going into the season. I think he will, will be a very uh, good part of the offense, and I think that was a, uh, a wise pick at that, po at that point. As far as the rest of their draft, I mean, we know they took uh, Travis as a – I'm not even sure he's healthy yet, but as a future quarterback, he wouldn't have been picked on the fifth round if he had been healthy. He might even have been a second-round pick. Kid has talent. Again, they don't need him short-term, so – they can take their time, you know, keep them on the roster, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you about the guys they took on the sixth and seventh, uh, you know, late in it. I know they got Mr. Relevant, but hey, we'll see what happens with those guys. As far as the Giants, I never thought the Giants were going to waver from neighbors. I told you all along, that's what I heard. I trusted the source I heard it from who told me about 10 days ago that the Giants were locked into neighbors as long as a guy like Harrison didn't slip. That they were taking an offensive lineman. They were not going to trade up. You heard rumors they kicked the tires with the Patriots. I don't think they were that serious about the pick. I think if they could have got it at a real reasonable rate, they would have taken a shot. But I think they wanted a, a real speedster, a game-breaking wide receiver. That's what this guy is. Are you worried about his makeup? I am always worried about players' makeup. Uh, always. And this kid's supposed to be a little bit hard to handle. Hey, we'll see. One thing we know is he's got a lot of game-breaking ability, and that's what you're looking for. Now, does this mean that the Giants are committed to Daniel Jones? No, it doesn't. It means that right now, Daniel Jones and Lockett are quarterbacks. That's all it means. It doesn't mean he's here long term. It doesn't mean anything more than what it says. That is that he's there this year. That's it. Um, the tight end they took on the fourth round. Everyone seems to be high on. We'll see. Um, the kid from Purdue on the fifth round who switched from wide receiver to running back might be an interesting piece. We'll see. Again. 
you don't know about those guys. You don't know how they're going to fit into the system. You don't know whether they're going to work or not. What you're looking at is what's immediate help for the Giants, a wide receiver who walks in day one, starts, and is a game-breaking wide receiver. That's what Neighbors is. He starts from day one. He becomes their primary big home run hitter. That's the way it is, and that's what he becomes right away. As far as uh, the safety they took on the second round from Minnesota, fine. Okay. Um, Giants took a safety, then a corner, then a tight end, then a running back, then a linebacker. Fine. They were the only team, I think, that did not draft a lineman with any pick. They're the only team that didn't draft an offensive or a defensive lineman. They drafted uh, wide receiver, safety, corner, tight end, running back, linebacker. Does that matter? No. Listen, they had gone out in free agency and fixed what they felt they needed to do. Their offensive line was not in as sad a shape as the Jets was. They had some useful pieces already in place and one very prominent piece already in place. The Jets went out and got a guy who could be a 10-year starter for them and could be a starter for them this year if he has to. I wouldn't mind if he wound up. Now, I don't see him playing guard. I do think he could play right tackle right now if Smith at left tackle. Or he could wind up just being a backup right now and providing insurance. Hey, that's fine too. You need depth. You need to develop an eight-man core that is tough, versatile, and that can play multiple positions. I don't see this kid as a multiple position. I think he's a tackle. But he might be able to play some right as he awaits to play left in the future. He's not going to be left tackle right away. They went out and got themselves a premier left tackle. And Smith, let's be honest, Smith is as good as it gets. I mean, he is a, I'm not saying he's automatic Hall of Fame, but he is going to be a very serious Hall of Fame candidate. There's no question about it. He's that good. How many years do you have left? I don't know. I'd say one or two for sure. Now, has he had years when he's been injured? Yes. But now you have some depth there. And I would say, you know, people are excited the way the Jets maneuvered around. Hey, people get too involved with the artistry, the science of the draft. They did this, they moved here, they were smart here. They were Bottom line is, get pieces you can use. Add to the quality of your team. And on the first round, get a piece that fills a need. The idea we don't draft for need, nonsense. Most teams draft for need. Because you go into the offseason and you have holes. And you have two ways to fill them, free agency and the, top, and the premium rounds of the draft. That's how you fill them. There's no other way to do it. Trades don't work in the NFL. They're very few and far between. So you, you have two ways to fill it. And you go in, and we talked about this from the minute the season ended, that the Jets had to put every ounce of their worth into developing and securing that offensive line. They've done that. They've done that exactly the way we had hoped they would do that. So that's a very distinct positive right now. Very big positive. So from that standpoint, nobody's worried. Nobody's screaming. It's going to be interesting right now. Listen, the Jets have a great quarterback. When he's healthy and he's behind center and he can be protected, he's a great quarterback still. They have one of the real good wide receivers. He's a legitimate top flight wide receiver. They have now a left tackle who is a premium player. All-star player. And they have a running back who is really one of the more explosive players in the league. And it was just coming into his own. This should be a great year for him. But what you haven't seen yet, which you're going to see here is, if you have Rodgers for a full season, and he is operating behind a 
good to somewhere from average to good offensive line. He is going to make the other receivers. He is going to make the tight ends. He is going to make these guys so productive. He is going to make them look so good because the ball will always be right there. You don't have to go out and get a star tight end. He will make his tight ends a highly productive, borderline all-star player just with his play calling and his accuracy. He, all he needs is average receivers and he will make them quality players based by the way he throws the football and the incredible accuracy with which he throws the football. This guy is as accurate as any quarterback I've ever seen. And that's saying a lot. I mean, that that, that is high praise. But listen, this guy's as good. I've never seen anybody play the position better when he's on top of his game. He's that good. And I don't think he's done by any stretch, but he has to be protected, and now they've done that. So people are going to expect big things out of the Jets. Their defense is good. Their head coach needs to really understand what it means to be a head coach. This is his last chance to get this. If he doesn't get it this year, okay, he's not going to, he's not going to, first of all, if they stumble this year, he's out. Secondly, it's now or never for him to grasp what the job is. He has not done that yet. It's got to happen now. As for the Giants, this is a very big year for Dable, who a lot of the lust has come off with what went on with Wink, what went on with his other assistants, what went on last year with the team. Okay. He went from being up here to he lost all that right back to where he's starting, I think, year three, about level. He needs a good year. He needs this team to improve rapidly. And he needs to get something out of the quarterback position. He might have designs on somebody else or some other player down the road, but right now this is what he's got, and he's got to make it work. So there's pressure on him this year. There's obviously an enormous amount of pressure on the quarterback, but there's a lot of pressure on the Jets too because this is it. You don't know how many years – this quarterback's going to be here. You don't know how many years he's got left to play. He can't sustain another injury. That, that can't happen. If it does, that, I, I think that would be the end. But I don't expect that to happen this year. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Now, a little on baseball. Um, the Mets needed one yesterday. They got it. They got it the way they've gotten a lot of games, late-inning scoring, late-inning heroics, good bullpen pitching. Garrett's been unbelievable. Now he's 5-0. and He's got a 0.61 ERA. Um, Bader has gotten a bunch of big hits, as has the bottom of the order. And that was a very big home run for Vientos, who's obviously wanting any chance he can get. A lot of his room for to operate was taken away with the Martinez signing, obviously. Um, But when he gets his chances, he's got to make the most of them. And that was a very, very big home run yesterday. We know he's got power, but they needed that game. They really needed it in the worst way. You know, they lost two out of three in San Francisco. They had lost the last one. And now they lost the first two against the Cardinals. They have the Cubbies coming in. They needed a win. They're 14 and 13. And now they got a uh, four game set with the Cubbies starting this evening. The Yankees uh, flexed their muscle the last couple of days. I mean, not often you score 15 runs in back to back games against a team that was operating very well, as a matter of fact. Yankees are 19 and 10. 
what I wanted to see, which I mentioned the other day, was I wanted to see the left-handed power start to pick up. I wanted to see Grisham do something, and he did. He finally hit a three-run home run. And Verdugo showing some more pop. Like I said, I think they're going to get 50 extra base hits out of Verdugo this year. He's going to hit 20 home runs. He's got a swing that's going to be very conducive to him hitting home runs once he gets very comfortable. And he seems like he's getting comfortable at Yankee Stadium. But we need to see the left-handed side other than sort of start to pop a little bit, and they did. And Torres got going a little bit also. So things are, you know, looking up. Their offense hasn't been overly consistent this year, but that's fine. That's fine. It's still early, not even May yet. We've got a couple more days before it's May. You know, you're not unhappy being 19 and 10. That's fine. And although there's some holes to fill and some issues to deal with, they they look very competitive in a American league where there's, you know, there's not really, you know, the Orioles are going to be there. You know that the Rays just got beat up by the White Sox. So then that one's a 500. Um, I know Cleveland has been a big, big surprise so far, really big surprise so far, but you know, their offense isn't very good. So I don't know if that's going to last, but they are off to a uh, very, very fast start. You know, same nineteen and nine to the Yankees, nineteen and ten. Orioles are doing just fine. Uh, Tampa Bay, three hundred five hundred after, you know, getting beat up by the White Sox, which is hard to imagine. Um, Houston continues to tell you they're not worried. They're nine and nineteen. They got a long way to go. The Mets at 14 and 13. Yes, Atlanta's good. Yes, Philly's good. You expected that. Philly's 19 and 10. Atlanta's 19 and 7. Both good teams. Both better teams than the Mets. Washington's been a big surprise at 13 and 14. That's a lot better than we expected from them. Expected them to lose about 100 games. They might still, but that's still a nice start at 13 and 14. A lot better. And Miami, you know, at 0 9, never was going to get out of the way of that, and they haven't. They're 6 and 23. And they're not going to get out of the way of that under any circumstances. With some of the injuries they've had and everything else that's going on, that start is going to completely finish their year. It probably already has. But as we start the month of May, you have to be very positive about where the Yankees are. And you have to be content with where the Mets are. And the Mets have gotten it with surprisingly good pitching. And some clutch hitting. You know, there's a lot of games where the Mets don't score early and then they have a habit of scoring late. Lindor's got five home runs, but he still needs to get more consistent, which he will. Martinez is going to give them a lift in the lineup because he's a pro hitter. You know, Marte's been good so far, and they've gotten some contributions from guys like Bader who and Taylor and guys like that who have done very, very well. So they keep their head above water, and as long as they do that, you're okay. I mean, 14 and 13 is, you know, that's fine. Especially after an 0-5 start. But they needed that one yesterday, and they've had to have it. You know, they really have done a good job of coming from behind. They've got a lot of late-inning hits, and Bate has got a bunch of big hits. You know, he doesn't put it up amazing offensive numbers, but he's gotten a bunch, really a bunch of big hits. Time and time again. You know, he's really delivered, and so is Taylor delivered also. And, you know, that's what they need. They need these guys. They need the whole roster to contribute, and that's really where they are right now. And what a lift they've gotten from some guys out of the pen and some of the starting pitching too. And I tell you, uh, Garrett's been just unbelievable. 5-0, and 0. 0.61 ERA. I mean, he's off to just a, a sensational start. He has been just tremendous. And... Those are the kind of things that you, you know, hope happens. Comes out of nowhere and does that. You know, as far as the uh, 
NBA now. You know, I know that uh, the Sixers, especially Embiid, were very upset with how many uh, Nick fans infiltrated the building, especially around the court, because <laughs> there were a lot of Nick fans there. There's no question about it, and it annoyed them uh, to no end. But hey, it's a short drive, and people are willing to sell their tickets, so hey, there's not much you can do about it. I would think the Knicks will be able to get this fifth game. I don't expect it to be easy. I think the extra day, not having the extra day is going to affect Embiid. You know, they tried. Nurse is, is you know, dead if he does, dead if he doesn't. doesn't. They tried to yesterday get through that game, you know, without resting him in the second half. And you can say it backfired on him, and it did. But if they had taken him out, when he took him out in the second quarter, the Knicks went wild. I mean, and Philly couldn't score. Now, Philly couldn't score down the stretch yesterday anyway because one thing that has happened, and I've, uh, I've told you about it time and time again, we've been talking about it, they can't come up with anybody to be a consistent third scorer. So they force Maxi to take shots. And Embiid, when he's not trying to get some rest, you know, they tried to, to live with him yesterday. They put Embiid on the floor for 43 minutes. He can't go that far. They couldn't find the time to rest him in the second half, so they rested him on the court. He'd step out of a play, go off to the side, let Maxi go to the basket. Maxi had an okay game, didn't have a great game. 23 points, 8 for 21 from the floor. But they couldn't get a good look or a good shot when Embiid was not the focal of the offense, when he was tired, and he clearly was tired down the stretch of the game. Clearly was tired. And the Nick unit, even with Robinson out yesterday and Bogdanovich hurt yesterday, the Knicks got contributions off the bench. McBride gave them a good lift, scored 13 points, and Achua gave them a heck of a fourth quarter. He played defense. He blocked shots. He had four blocks. He had seven rebounds. He had four offensive rebounds. In the, from the two-minute mark of the, of the third quarter to the end of the game, the Knicks got every loose ball. They got a million offensive rebounds. I mean, Hart had a terrible game from the floor, and he only had a handful of points, and he didn't make a basket from the floor, but his rebounding was unbelievable. You know, Hart winds up with 15 rebounds, five offensive he blocked three shots. He hustles all over the place. Yeah, he went 0 for 7 from the floor. Made some free throws. Only 4 of 8 yesterday, but 15 rebounds. And OG gave him a heck of a game. 16 points, 14 rebounds, three blocks. Actually played in bead for some moments there. Played good defense. So they got a really good game out of him. And obviously Brunson has a game that until he breaks the mark at 47 will stand. I mean, 47 and 10 is a hell of a game. And he has done a very good job. And we talked about when they went down to Philly after the two nightmare games he had here that he was going to have to figure it out. And give him credit because he did a much better job of figuring it out. And the Knicks would go to hard screens, which when they switched it, they would have trouble getting the right angles on Brunson on the switch, which would get Brunson an edge into the lane where he'd either step back and make the shot or hesitate and get the foul shot. 
or just give you that little flip in the lane. He has figured out how to drive it, how to pace it, how to come hard off the screen and beat his defender to the spot. And you see him gaining in confidence where he got off to a fast start yesterday. And although he hasn't been knocking down his threes in the series, he's getting to the foul line. He got there 11 times yesterday. And he was 18 to 34 from the floor. I understand 34 is a lot of shots, but the guy scored 47 points. And if he shoots 47 points, he gets 47 points and 10 assists. That's a remarkable ball game. And he was there to clean up when he had to clean up. And he uses hesitations and his ability to draw fouls very well. And Embiid was exhausted in the fourth quarter. You saw it more on that play when they inbounded after the foul before they inbounded the ball. They took one shot. Lowry took one shot, and now he's inbounded again. They inbound the ball to Embiid. He's about eight feet on the baseline, and they're giving him the shot. But he decides, I'm taking it right to the rack. He probably thought on the way there that he was going to dunk it, and then he thought, I can't get off the ground. So he tries to make a layup. Now, he might have gotten fouled. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But he normally is going to jam that ball. But he was so exhausted, he got caught in between. And he didn't even score on that play. And you even saw him miss a couple of free throws in the fourth quarter, which is just from exhaustion. He scored one point in the fourth quarter. Think about what he did in game three, and think about the fact he scored one point in the fourth quarter on a free throw. That's it. So he's on the floor the whole time. They're trying to get by without sitting him down because that's something they can't live with. When they took him out in the second quarter, they had a 10-point lead after the first quarter. They take him out. Knicks right away make it a four-point game. They have to rush him beat back into the game. What Nurse has got to do in game five is he has got to somehow steal a couple of minutes without him beat on the floor where you can give him bona fide rest he cannot do what he did again and make him go 24 minutes in the second half. It will not work. It will not work. Now, the Knicks didn't look good when Brunson was off the floor. But, again, he can go that many minutes. Embiid can't. And you saw an Embiid in the fourth quarter who was basically out on his feet. Maxi was trying to score, and they missed their last 10 10- Field goal attempts. While the Knicks had Brunson making shots and at least made enough shots or got enough offensive rebounds that they had enough opportunities to make shots. Their offensive rebounding in the fourth quarter was tremendous. Their hustle, their defensive intensity in the fourth quarter were all tremendous. And that was OG, and it was Hart, and it was Achua. And they got points from McBride. See, they've gotten nothing off the bench in this series, nothing. Buddy Heald, who's a guy who has a reputation for being a real big three-point shooter, doesn't even play anymore. Batum, remember, Batum beat Miami in the play-in game with a 20-point performance where he went wild from three. He did nothing in this series and nothing again yesterday. They need to get some points from somewhere, and they got no points from Harris in the second half, zero. He had 10 at the half. He didn't score in the second half. Missed a wide-open layup, missed a couple of threes, couldn't score from three. They need him to shoot and score. They have to. He has to be an aggressive offensive player. Uber gave him some points, but... Again, they're collected points. Then he's not a scorer. They don't have a bona fide third scorer. The Knicks have 
a bunch of different guys that they can, you know, if this, if, if Dante's not on, they can go to McBride. If Hart's not doing it, maybe OG is. Hartstein gives them a couple of points here and there with those baby flips and everything. And of course, you know, their lead guard and their star gave him 47 and 10 yesterday. Which made things a whole lot better. Now, don't think for a second that this is going to be a pushover in game five because it won't. You're going to get more of the same. But I think the short turnaround and the wear and tear in this series, Embiid's going to get more tired as the series progresses. He's not anywhere near healthy. And I think he's. I think he's running out of gas. And they don't have enough other firepower to get it done. I don't know if Robinson's going to play or not. I don't know if Bogdanovich's going to play or not. But they don't get enough from their role players to make a, you know, to make a big difference. They need Maxi to go off. Remember the first two games Maxi scored, you know, in the 30s both games. So I would expect the same. I would expect Philly to get off to a decent start in the game. I expect Embiid to get off to a decent start in the game. But the Knicks should be able to wear him down and out. And I think the Knicks, if they run him, that would be a big positive, is take your opportunity breaks, get your energy baskets, beat them up the floor, whether you're beating them up with Hart, beating them up with OG, whatever. Dante, beat him up the floor. Make Take advantage of that and make him – go back and forth quickly because all that does is deteriorate for him. It makes him really, really deteriorate more and more and more. Now, a couple of things. Number one, Milwaukee, which had a roster that should have been really special this year, has just completely fallen apart. The little trade didn't work. And now they played without Lillard and the freak who obviously is not coming back in this series. And what is with Portis? Portis is one of my favorite role players in the league. Love Portis. Love him. But how disgraceful was his action yesterday? He's in a game where he knows he becomes, at worst, their second option. They need him to go out there and get him 20 and 10, which he'll do. He's incredibly consistent. And what does he do? He gets in a fight. He slaps the guy in the face. He gets thrown out of the game. How can he get thrown out of that game yesterday? I mean, that is sinful that he gets himself thrown. He's a veteran player. Get himself thrown out of that game when he doesn't have Lillard and he doesn't have the freak. You know what? That's when your team is just completely out of control. I have an idea of what's going on. Bucks it down 3-1. Unless we get some miracle finish from the freak where he's back and he's, you know, taken over, which doesn't look to be the case. That series looks to be pretty much over. Um, I thought the Mavs would win. I don't know how bad the injury suffered in game three by Doncic is. He played a lot of minutes yesterday. He didn't play well. After the game, he said he let Irving down. Irving had a great game yesterday, 40 points in 44 minutes, played really well. I'm hard on him, but I, I got to give him his kudos. You know, he played really well yesterday. Doncic's not shooting the ball well, and he's not defending at all. He's getting killed, killed off the dribble, absolutely destroyed. He's got a bad knee right now, and he's playing with it. He played 44 minutes. Now, you look at his line, you say, wait a second, the guy was 29, 10, and 10. Yeah, but not what you expect from him. He didn't score much in the fourth quarter. He was one for nine from three. That 10 for 24 from the floor, that's not what you expect. You expect better from him. And his defense was really bad. Now, Leonard's hurt again, but they got 33 from Harden. They got 33 from George. You know, that's two stars, two stars. And the, and the series is tied up right now. So I still think the Mavs are going to win the series, but it's going to be a long series. The Suns 
should be completely ashamed of themselves. To get swept by the T-Wolves. They matched up really well against T-Wolves, but you know what? Those three guys can't play together. And think about it. The Suns a couple of years ago were a bounce of the ball away from a championship, and they completely destroyed the team. And they went and got Durant, and they went and got Beal, and neither one fits. And I'll tell you, right now they have three hundred million. I mean, 200 million wrapped up in the three players. And they would love to get rid of Beal and Durant, but they who's going to take them? Who's going to take those contracts? They go down four straight in really embarrassing fashion. And, you know, they just, they don't know how to play together. And they're terrible together. As a matter of fact, the three of them on the court together, the numbers are incredibly bad. Now, the Celtics got beat in game two. They came back and really buried them in game three. I, I'd be surprised if the Heat win another game in the series. I do think the Celtics, who are going to have a, an easy round against either Cleveland or Orlando, and I think Cleveland will win that series, but um, it's going to be harder than I thought. I think they'll win game five and go on and win the series, but give Orlando credit for playing well in their building. Blew them out the first, the third game, and then the second, uh, fourth game blew them out second half. So give them credit for that. But you know, you go into these playoffs and there's no freak and there's no Lillard. And now there's no Leonard, and you go, and you got Don saying he's hurt, and you go back and forth, and you got to deal with the stuff with Embiid, and it's just, you know, no Butler, and you, you know, hey, it's a big part of it. It's a really big part of it. I don't see, although Murray might not play, I still don't think the Lakers win game five. And I like what the Thunder is going to become, but they're not ready yet. I think Denver will be in the finals again, which doesn't surprise anybody. Um, I like Oklahoma State. I like the way they play, but I think they need to go through this and this will be a big learning experience for them. And I'm looking forward to the Knicks in Boston, which I think we can get to. You know, let's not put the cart before the horse, but I think we can get there. And that should be fun, and I don't think Boston is unbeatable. They deserve to be the favorites without any question. They can back that up without any question. But there's something that's just not right with that team. If you play them the right way and at the right pace, you can beat them. Now, we've got a busy week again. Um, we'll be on after the Nick game tomorrow night, but we'll do something tomorrow first and preview it, get you an update on injuries and everything else tomorrow morning. Um, We'll be on after the Nick game, hopefully wrapping up the series and looking ahead to the next series. Uh, we have the Derby this week. Uh, you know, you know, I wish we would have been able to get uh, Reynolds Channel there. We got a late start with them a little bit. We missed. We didn't have him ready so that he could run the Derby prep. So we don't have the points to get in. Hopefully, we'll be able to join the classics somewhere along the way, either in the Preakness or the Belmont Stakes. That would be our hope. We're still pointing for that direction. We haven't ruled out the Preakness yet. And we could easily go Peter Pan on the 11th and then the Preakness up in Saratoga. Which remember, the Preakness, I mean, the uh, Belmont up in Saratoga. Remember, the Belmont Stakes this year is different. It's in Saratoga. There's going to be a four-day racing festival up there. The tickets are already sold out. I mean, the city is completely sold out. It's going to be a huge June up there for four days. And the race is a mile and a quarter instead of a mile and a half, which is very important for a lot of reasons in that, number one, it makes it a sire-induced. mile and a half race is not a sire race. 
you don't make studs in that race. You can make studs now at a mile and a quarter in Belmont. I mean, at Saratoga. So that's going to be a big positive. And I think we'll draw more people to the race. First, the Preakness in two weeks, and then the Belmont three weeks after that. Uh, but that racing festival up there is going to be great. This week, we'll do the, uh, the Derby later in the week. Have that for you. And plenty of uh, basketball, baseball, and we'll start to get into the hockey too. As we're going to, we'll preview the what will be, I'm sure, the Nick, uh, the uh, Rangers and the Hurricane, and should and should be a. From what everybody tells me, now, Caroline's been impressive in the series. The matchup with the Rangers. We'll have a lot to say about that, and we'll bring some, hopefully, bring some uh, hockey guys on to talk about it too, uh, as we get closer to that series, which looks like it's going to be a terrific, terrific second round matchup between two teams, obviously, with the ability to wear to win it all. Enjoy your Monday. <laughs>